Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, two topics to talk about. Uh, first one, according to a presentation make it, made by Jackie Van Heest, PhD at the International Society of Sports Nutrition in Phoenix this year, female athletes can improve their performance by eating more food. Um, most female athletes are encouraged to be as lean as possible, so much so that some of them develop eating disorders and many become so lean, their body fat drops so low that they actually stop menstruating. Van Heese says that amenorrhea results from really hard training schedules which mimic stressors that our ancestors faced such as famine and forced relocation. Historically, females stop reproducing under such difficult circumstances because of the poor chance of survival for both the female and offspring. Van he's reported the results of a longitudinal study conducted by her and her colleagues that involved measuring the hormone levels of elite female swimmers during an entire season. So they covered, um, including, uh, they covered a period of time that included increasing training, reaching peak performance, and then tapering off before uh, various competitive events. The researchers found that women who continue to have regular menstrual periods during the entire training cycle, the entire season, improved their performance more than women who had stopped menstruating. According to Van Heest, coaches frequently recommend that their athletes be as light as possible in order to improve performance. And one of the problems with this is that females, particularly females, are susceptible to this message and more inclined to over-restrict food intake due to the fact that women are often even more concerned than men with body image and appearance and weight status. This restricted intake combined with hard training results in uh, much lighter and more what you might call ripped athletes, which is long, to believe, long believed to lead to better outcomes in terms of performance. But then he says that the slightly heavier athlete who is eating more in order to maintain normal hormone levels can outperform a leaner, lighter, more ripped competitor. High performance athletes, both those who are professional athletes and those who do things that, that are aggressive, you know, enter marathons and endurance events and that sort of thing just for fun, um, really need to make sure that they're consuming enough food. And it's very interesting because the protein issue comes up all the time with athletes, as some of you know. Uh, eat more protein in order to improve performance. I actually had an intern. Uh, who spent a lot of time here from Germany, who did an extensive amount of research on this, on this issue. And what she kept coming up with is the studies continue to show that it really isn't eating a lot of protein. It's just caloric adequacy. If you want a, an athlete to perform well, you just have to eat enough calories. So women who starve themselves lean and ripped really don't, don't uh, do the best by themselves if they're trying to be uh, competitive. So eat more food. And sometimes people think that that's really challenging on a plant-based diet. It really isn't. It's a matter of adding extra food to each meal and sometimes inserting a couple of meals in the day. And we show athletes how to do this all the time. We'll show them, hey, so for somebody like me, this is what um, you know lunch might look like. You're going to eat the same lunch. You're just going to eat bigger portions of some of it. And you would eat a bigger meal uh, after you work out a couple times a day and, and that sort of thing. And it's actually quite easy to do. We have some elite athletes who've worked with us that eat as much as 5,000 calories a day. All right, the next topic is dreadful, but we have to talk about it, chemotherapy. Uh, the reason why this type of thing is coming up, lots of cancer uh, talks during the summer is because I'm teaching a, a class on uh, cancer treatment and uh, nutrition and cancer prevention, uh, diets during treatment and as treatment and that sort of thing. So uh, doing a lot of research in this area, reading through a lot of archived articles on my own server. So here goes. Um, chemotherapy, while it can be an important tool if used in the right way for the right types of cancer patients, um, and some people are surprised at that. I, I've always cautioned people, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, we don't use chemotherapy very effectively in this country, but it can be effective when used properly. Um, the problem is that it's overprescribed and it's often recommended to patients that have absolutely no chance of benefiting from it. The reason why cancer patients seek treatment is they want to live longer, which means that any treatment that we offer to cancer patients should be judged by how much it actually increases survival or longer life. And so if an oncologist recommends chemotherapy, he or she should be able to show that doing this particular course of treatment is going to lead to longer survival time. 
but that's not the case for many patients. For example, a review looking at the survival benefit for adult cancer patients that could actually be attributed just to the chemotherapy in Australia and the United States showed that the overall contribution of chemotherapy to five years survival, and by the way, the fact that five years is the benchmark um, is very disturbing to me because um, a 45-year-old person is really not interested in living to 50. They'd like to live their full lifespan, all right? But let's go with it for now. So how much of the total survival could you attribute uh, to chemotherapy for five-year survival? 2.3% in Australia, 2.1% in the United States. And of course, chemotherapy um, has a lot of side effects. And, and um, for some people, they might look at that risk-benefit ratio and say, you know, for a couple points, I'm not going to do it. The researchers concluded, quote, to justify the continued funding and availability of drugs used in cytotoxic chemotherapy, a rigorous evaluation of the cost-effectiveness and impact on quality of life is urgently required. Now, one would think that a rigorous evaluation would have already been conducted since sales of cancer drugs exceeded $100 billion a year in 2015 and are expected to hit $150 billion a year in 2020. Well, while many studies show that chemotherapy doesn't extend life, some show a disturbing uh, trend. Chemotherapy can actually cause metastases. While killing some tumor cells, chemotherapy, certain chemotherapies can facilitate the entry of cancer cells into the bloodstream, which actually induces metastases. And by the way, localized cancers don't kill people most of the time. Um, it is metastasized cancer that is the cause of death and what we've made no progress in treating. So in other words, while decreasing tumor size, which is considered the measurement of success, cancer drugs like um, paclitaxel taken after death, doxa, um, uh, doxorubicin and psychophobia phosphamide, drug pronunciations are always difficult for me, increase metastatic dissemination of cancer cells. So you solve one problem, at least temporarily, the tumor shrinks and you end up increasing the chance of metastases. By the way, this is not the only other study. I was able to find three other studies showing that um, commonly used chemotherapy cancer drugs induce metastases and they're included in this article. So one might ask the question, and I think it's a legitimate one, why are these drugs so widely prescribed? Where does the enthusiasm of oncologists come from? Well, as you might imagine, some of it is due to the conflicts of interest inherent in oncology. Oncologists are some of the highest paid doctors in the world and their income is increasing faster than many other specialties. And this is due to what is called the chemo concession. Oncologists are able to purchase chemotherapy drugs at wholesale and sell them at retail in their office. And the retail profit is as much as two thirds of their practice income. Now this is an awful system that can turn even the most well-intentioned physician into an enterprising profiteer. I've often said that one of the problems we have today is good people being forced into bad institutions and bad institutional settings. It's how ethical people become compromised. One of the manifestations of this system is that because oncologists have a vested financial interest in what their patients do, many of them are not geeked up about alternatives to chemotherapy because patients who seek alternative care spend their money elsewhere. Now there are undoubtedly good doctors who've not been corrupted by this awful situation. There are some we know that have been. Dr. Richard Ablin, a personal friend of mine, describes just such a situation in his book, The Great Prostate Hoax. Dr. Hakon Ragdi, MD, is an internationally renowned urologist from Norway who developed a method of treating prostate cancer that proved to be very effective in high-risk patients. He relocated his research project to California, but he ended up going back to Norway, explaining to Dr. Ablin, quote, we had to close our clinical trial. Oncologists in the area referred patients for the trial until they saw the good results. It scared the hell out of them to think that a simple and relatively inexpensive treatment that works might be under development. One guy confided to me that he loved the treatment, but he had three kids to put through college. Doesn't that just make you a tiny bit nauseous? The biggest problem with all of this, in my opinion, none of this information about things like efficacy, chance for metastases, conflicts of interest is shared with patients prior to their making a decision about treatment. I think it is almost certain that many patients would make different decisions if this type of information was disclosed. And furthermore, many times cancer patients are pressured by well-meaning family and friends who say you should listen to your doctor's instructions. This idea that you're going to do something else is insane. I think if they saw this type of information, they might back off of that dogma just a little bit. 
Current treatment for cancer results in a predictable pattern. Cancer patients are told they'll get the best available treatment, which really isn't true in many cases. The treatment appears to work in the short term because the tumors shrink. And then the cancer begins to progress again, this time more aggressively than, than before. The cancer patient realizes that he or she did not benefit from the treatment and starts looking for alternatives. But many things that might have been beneficial at one time, or maybe even um, reverse the cancer, are not effective with more aggressive cancer and a weakened body due to treatment. The time to ask questions and look at evidence is before, not after beginning any course of treatment for cancer. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And one more thing, you guys are always asking me where all the references are for these articles. They're posted in the Health Brace Library. You can become a subscriber by calling our office at 614-841-7700. And I'll be back to you next Tuesday with more news.